Welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello from Pier 39 in San Francisco and welcome to episode number 100. And 71 of the Skeptic Zone. Richard Saunders here with you, gazing out on uh, about 30 or 40 floating punts, pontoons, half of them filled up with sea lions. It's quite the tourist attraction here in downtown San Francisco. It's a beautifully sunny, warm winter's day. Lots of school children around uh, being amused by the... The sea lions who are probably involved in some deep philosophical argument right now. But coming up on today's Skeptic Zone, we have a special episode with Eugenie Scott, Dr. Eugenie Scott, and a tour of the National Center for Science Education in Oakland, which is not too far away from where I am at the moment. Now, uh, Jeannie Scott and the National Center for Science Education have taken a big leap very uh, recently, they've decided to aid and support teachers in their endeavors to um, teach climate change or the science behind climate change. What has she gotten herself into? We'll let her explain coming up at the top of the show. Then after the break, Jeannie Scott takes us on a tour of the National Center for Science Education, sort of behind the scenes look at the facility itself. Then to wrap up the show, our very own Dr. Rachie, Dr. Rachel Dunlop, just the other day was on national television in Australia on a show called The Project, which is on the 10 Network. And she was a special guest on there to chat about conspiracy theories. Well done and congratulations to Dr. Rachie for appearing on primetime national television. Well, as the school children run around me like crazy and the sea lions are just basking in the sunshine, talking to some seagulls over there, I'm going to uh, walk down to the next pier along, grab myself a lovely bowl of clam chowder and sourdough, a sourdough bowl. Oh, I love it whenever I'm here. Have a nice root beer and I'll let you enjoy the Skeptic Zone. As promised, listeners, once again I've made my way here to Oakland in uh, California to visit the National Center for Science Education and speak to my dear friend Jeannie Scott. Hello, Jeannie. Hi. It's so good to see you again. Thank you. Here we are, back again in your office. Um, we uh, must think now, maybe I've been here four or five times over the years to, to catch up and but chat. But who is counting? But who's counting? And it's it's always a pleasure to come and, and see what's changed and what's new and I always ask you the same questions so I'll, I'll start with this, the, the, the question <laughs> I always ask you since we've last had a good chat which is about a year ago when I came to visit what have been the big developments here at the, uh, the Centre for Science Education? The really big development and the thing that is um, we are very excited about uh, and a little nervous about is that we have decided that just as teachers have problems with the teaching of evolution and need some support, some advice, some help, so also we are discovering they are having problems with teaching global warming and climate change and similarly need that kind of support, advice, and help to continue teaching good science. Uh, we see um, uh, more and more examples of uh, legislation being proposed that would affect, uh, compromise the teaching of climate change. Uh, we get more reports from individual teachers about 
uh, students getting up and walking out of class or students, uh, parents showing up saying, uh, you're not going to teach my kid that the climate's getting warmer, are you? Uh, that this is a liberal plot somehow and on and on. So teachers are being faced with what is really a political or an ideological pressure uh, against the teaching of climate change, much as they have over the years been faced with the political, ideological, if you will, pressure against the teaching of evolution. Wow. Wow, this is a topic I... I um, what's the term? Um, fools rush in where <laughs> angels fear to tread. This is this is one of the, the topics of the fool that is I. I, I. You know, I seldom cover this on the skeptic zone. It, it occurs to me that in the past, and you're continuing fight and battle against the forces of creationism and so on, largely religiously based, mm-hmm. now you're tackling something which is a bit broader, I think. People, people tend to just simply decide that uh, the, the world is not warming or, or the science must be wrong, rather than coming from a religious background. It's not... Uh, you are completely correct. There, there are not... Um, there are not... Uh, total parallels between the two problems that you know the teachers are facing. Um, let, let me underscore first that there is a difference between what we do here and what you do. I mean, you are looking at skepticism, you are looking at pseudoscience, and uh, our overlap uh, in terms of you what you do on your podcast and NCSE is creationism as a pseudoscience, and that is yes, what got yes. us talking originally years ago. What we do here is we really look at science education and the creationism problem is an issue for science education just like it's an interest to skepticism and when I'm wearing my Bay Area skeptics hat then you know we we are very interested in that as well. One parallel between uh, climate science education and uh, evolution education is that the opposition to either of these topics comes from an ideology, but it's a different ideology. The opposition to evolution is a religious ideology. Generally, it's conservative Christians, although they're in Europe there's much more pushback from uh, uh, Muslims. Uh, in uh, ah, in right. Israel, the pushback comes from the super-Orthodox right. Jews. So, right. How you know, ironic, yes. Right. Yeah. So there you have it. Um, opposition to teaching evolution comes almost... 100% from religious ideologies that don't accept it. Of course, there are plenty of religious ideologies that do, but you know the opposition comes from those who don't. When it comes to the teaching of climate change, it also is motivated by ideology, but a different ideology. In the United States, where you have perhaps these, the strongest expression of anti-global warming, the ideology, the, the primary ide- ideology is an, is an anti-big government. It's a political ideology. It's people who believe that global warming is bad science um, that is only being promoted by political liberals who are trying to build big government, uh, who are trying to take away individual American freedoms. And, of course, individual freedom is a real important part of the American uh, story about themselves. And uh, that somehow this all gets mixed up with liberal, conservative, political views. There's another component to the anti-global warming movement, and that is an economic ideology, which you tend to find uh, among libertarians and others of a what one um, uh, scholar has called free market fundamentalism. <laughs> Those who believe that the free market will solve all problems economically and that anything that appears to fetter the free market, such as cap and trade or a carbon tax or something that um, in some way is viewed as restricting the um, uh, ability of the uh, energy producers, the carbon, coal, gas, etc., uh, to to perform their you know, business decisions, that this is bad and this should be opposed. So the um, global warming is viewed as a um, push by those who are anti-capitalists, who want to increase socialism. So you can see how this kind of gets tied up with the conservative political ideology as it, well. It's, it's um, good fertile ground for conspiracy theory too, isn't it? Oh, quite, yeah. quite. So, um, you know, from the skeptic standpoint, there may not be 
that much of a link with anti-global warming because, um, well, may, maybe to the extent, I mean, the, the parallels that we see at NCSC is that an ideological view is motivating a, an anti-science view, uh, evolution and global warming. Um, our position is that what teachers should be focusing on is what is the consensus view of science? What is, is the majority of, of scientists uh, proposing as the best explanation at this time and place? And it's evolution, and it is that the planet is getting warmer and that people have an important responsibility in this. Now, if and when those uh, two consensuses uh, change, then teachers will should change what they're teaching. Evolution is very, 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 very solid. I mean, we, we don't anticipate that the no. idea that living things have common ancestors, no. the universe is very ancient, the planet's been moving. You know, I don't think that's going to change. If it does, we'll change what we teach. That's yeah. right. In the case of global warming, most Americans are not as aware of how solid the scientific consensus is around this. When climate scientists are polled, you find high 90%, 97 96% of climate scientists saying, yes, the planet is warming, uh, a good deal of it is anthropogenic or human-influenced. Um, there's arguments about how much, but climate scientists are pretty uniform that it's substantial. Yeah. And uh, if you poll scientists in general, you find, again, maybe not quite that high a percentage as among climate scientists, but at least in the 90s of scientists polled as a whole, agree the planet is getting warmer and that people have a lot to do with that. So that is the current scientific consensus. That is what we think teachers should teach. What we oppose is the idea that teachers should somehow shape their teaching because of ideological pressure. That is the parallel we see between anti-evolution and anti-climate change. Right. And that is that growing realization, which we studied for about a year and really thought carefully about this. I bet you did, yeah. That realization is what led us to decide, okay, we need to take this on. Teachers need help. We have a lot of experience at NCSC in dealing with political problems. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're we're very good at, at helping you write a letter to the school board or yes. helping you shape a presentation to the pool school board that will be effective or yeah. helping you craft an argument that will be uh, effective with a, a decision maker, a legislator or whatever. And that is the help that we hope we can offer to teachers as they're wrestling with this new problem That's of teaching climate change. It just... It, occurred to me, just came across my mind as you were speaking, the old phrase that uh, you've been battling for years, oh, evolution is just a theory, mm -hmm. of course, and we know how um, flawed that is. I just wonder how they're going to approach someone like you and this organization now coming into bat for the, the status quo, the consensus, what the opposition are going to come up with to say, oh, uh, climate change is just a theory? Are they going to use that one, do you think? They will attack the science. Yeah. They are attacking the science. This is what we're learning as we're um, becoming more and more familiar with both the science as well as the uh, denialist arguments against it. Uh, that is, of course, a, a tried-and-true approach. It was uh, used by um, those who uh, didn't believe that there should be um, changes made in the production of products that had chlorofluorocarbons when the ozone hole right. was revealed as you know a dangerous uh, item uh, a, a dangerous phenomenon that was taking place back in the 80s and that um, a chain you know restrictions should be made on uh, manufacturers of these of this chemical because it was contributing to a growth in the ozone hole well what was you know the the tried and true approach is you attack the science. Well, the sci the jury is still out. We're not really sure whether chlorofluorocarbons really do produce this effect. We shouldn't make any restrictions on the economy because people will you lose jobs and this is bad for capitalism, etc. The same old arguments. It's a tried and true strategy for the tobacco companies when they denied that the uh, consumption of uh, smoke caused. Uh, lung cancer and heart disease and other problems, the jury is still out. The science is still unsettled. We have our scientists that say A, you have your scientists that say B. So therefore, we shouldn't take any action. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same or, parallel or with Or as they change. do at tabloid television back home, especially they'll present two ridiculous 
sides of an argument and say, well, you decide. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? You've had some familiarity with that, haven't you? I have. Yes, yeah. yeah, indeedy. So, well, it, it, which is absurd. I mean, you give people two cartoon versions of, of uh, an argument and tell them to decide, and as if they could make a, an informed decision, it's, mm-hmm. it's just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. The, the argument with uh, tobacco and with the global, uh, excuse me, with the ozone hole and other scientific, quote, controversies, and, of course, currently with the problem with uh, global warming, is that there is a scientific consensus. There was fairly quickly a consensus among medical researchers that tobacco is bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there is currently a consensus among scientists, and especially climate scientists, that global warming is occurring, a big chunk of it is anthropogenic, and people need to know about this, and there are actions that one might assume would the society would, would take as a result of this. In order to stop these actions, the claim is made by the anti-global warming people that the science is still out. We have our scientists. We have this list of 30,000 scientists, which is something else we can talk about, mm-hmm. uh, which you know only goes to show that. Or we have these websites that are written by scientists course, yes, yes. that show that uh, the, the science of global warming is not settled. It's not a consensus. We, we shouldn't be uh, taking action. Um, NCSC is a very small operation. Uh, we um, don't take a position on policy issues. We're not going to argue that you should you know, go for cap and trade versus carbon tax or carbon tax versus cap and trade or any other kind of specific policy issue. We're not a policy institute. Right. We shouldn't venture where we don't have expertise. This is a big issue in Australia. With, oh, I know. Yeah. It's oh, huge. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's great. Uh, and it's wonderful that your government is taking enough interest and accepts the fact that the planet's getting warmer. We're not there yet. You're way ahead of us in that regard. But, you know, as a small, non-policy kind of institution, we're going to focus on what we are good at. What we are good at is helping teachers cope with these kinds of problems. And we're not going to take any positions on what should be done about it. Although our basic position as a science organization, really, and most of my staff are scientists, is that whatever decision society chooses to make about these very important issues should be firmly grounded in sound science. That's the key. That's the key. And Just uh, another thought that crossed my mind as we were chatting. Uh, back home, the, the, the leading voices, shall I say, um, for climate change denial seem to be right-wing shock jocks, mm-hmm. apart from anything else. They like to bluster and yell on the radio. And one of the most absurd arguments I've ever heard about uh, about this whole situation is there'll be a cold day somewhere in Australia, freezing conditions, you know, unusually cold. And they'll use that to say, what climate change? Look, the Earth's getting colder. Are you crazy? Yeah, There's yeah. no climate change, and it's just cold. Right. There's no global warming because it's cold over here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, of course, a couple of years ago in, this, in Washington, D.C., they had thigh-high snow. Yeah. I mean, this was phenomenal. And, of course, the... Well, there you go, you see? It, it case knocks all the global warming so out of the So, what do you water. mean it's getting warmer? <laughs> Look at all this snow that we have in... Yeah. And, of course, um, one reason why many uh, communicators started talking about climate change rather than global warming, even though global warming is at the heart of the global climate changes that are taking place all over the, the, the planet, it's maybe less confusing to people to uh, think about the climate changing rather than warming because we're getting more snow here or less, uh, you know, or more cold here. The fact of the matter is that the chi- the climate is going to be intensified and patterns are going to change. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and we're not entirely sure exactly what's going to happen, but we should expect more snow, say the climatologists, because. As the planet warms, the atmosphere holds more moisture, which means we're going to get more rain, more snow. Although, not uniformly, there are going to be, because of changes in ocean temperature, which is a very scary phenomenon, mm-hmm. I believe, because of changes in ocean temperature, currents are going to change. And that means that uh, places that, I mean, one very frightening possibility is that northern Europe might get a heck of a lot colder than it is now if there are substantial changes in the Gulf Stream moving further south, which may happen. And, of course, uh, the 
we do have measured uh, we, we do have measurements showing that the ocean is getting warmer, and the ocean is a huge driver of climate. You know, the yeah, whole sure. discussion of La, La Nina, El Nino, and so forth that is basically having to do with oceanic temperatures and the changes that take place over over a period of, of a couple of years. So we should expect the climate to change, and it is going to have effects on the planet as a whole, both land, atmosphere, and ocean. And, of course, the fundamental root of this climate change, which is the bigger picture, is global warming, because it is the warming of the planet uh, as a whole, because largely of the increased CO2 and uh, other uh, warming gases, shall we say, that is getting into the atmosphere and uh, creating this, uh, what sometimes referred to as the greenhouse effect. Yep. But certainly it is increasing the amount of warmth that is being retained by the atmosphere. It's not, you know. And of course, you know, I mean, there, there's so many frightening and, and fascinating, on one hand, um, uh, things that are going on. As the climate warms, the polar ice caps uh, reduce. Uh, we're seeing this very clearly with the, north, with the northern ice cap. And that in itself is going to increase the warming rate more quickly because uh, sun, sunlight is not going to be reflected off the poles. It's going to be absorbed by the, uh, by the darker uh, uh, oceanic uh, surfaces there. Yeah. So there's lots and lots of things to be conscious about. Wow, Jeannie, as if, as if your mind wasn't completely chock-a-block full of um, what you've been concentrating on for the past many years. <laughs> now this whole other realm has come in, and I can't even imagine the correspondence and the battles you're going to be entering into with this, because, I mean, I've seen people who are passionate on about creationism, and we both have, of course, mm -hmm. but the passion that is, that is stirred for, on this issue is... In all my years, it, it does generate the most passion I've seen. I've, I've been... I gave a talk once, and um, in the questions and answers, I talked about general skepticism, paranormal mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and someone in the audience demanded to know my views on the carbon tax and climate change, and I said, <laughs> look, I'm sorry, I'm not here to talk about that, and he was offended that I wouldn't even <laughs> talk about the subject. So, I, I, Which was not even relevant to the talk which you wasn't, gave. Exactly, but I was a skeptic, you see, oh, you must be... And this is a big issue in Australia, as you pointed out. Oh, it is a big issue in Australia. Well, let's take a break from that, Jeannie. Let's, let's uh, have a little wander around the uh, National Center for Science Education here, poke around some of the rooms. Very good. Mm -hmm. And I would also want to introduce you to my newest staff member, uh -huh. uh, Mark McCaffrey, who yep. is a climate scientist and uh, a specialist in climate science education. And he is going to be our... our strong right arm here and dealing with this issue. We, we, as you say, we, we've spent 25 plus years talking about evolution at NCSE and most of us on staff are evolutionary scientists of one form or another, biologists or geologists or anthropologists or something. So we needed to have that additional scientific strength on wow. staff. We, yeah, we yeah. felt that you know, we can. We're all smart people. We're going to learn a great deal about climate science, yeah. but we're not going to. You know, it's not like you have somebody who's trained in this field and yeah, who's yeah. really been working in this field for years and years. And yeah. We're delighted to have um, obtained uh, Mark's services. He will. He just started working for us uh, full time in January, so he's our newest guy. And I'll be sure that you meet him on our tour. All right. Well, let's have a little wander around and see who we can see and what we can see. All right. And be sure to look up as you walk around. And coming up after the break, Eugenie Scott takes us on a tour of the National Centre for Science Education. Hi, my name is Erica Dunning, and I recently published a book. My dad is Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. The title of my book is Polar Bear and the Trial of Leadership. You can find it on Amazon.com or through the link at SkepticZone.tv. It is an adventure novel about the trials of a group of animals trying to escape a corrupt queen. This book is great for families, adolescents, and children alike. And here it is again, Polar Bear and the Trial of Leadership by Erica Dunning. Thanks! Hi, this is Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. 
The best way to share the benefits of critical thinking and science with someone who doesn't listen to podcasts is to give them a book. I invite you to check out my newest book based on selected episodes of the Skeptoid podcast, Skeptoid 3, Pirates, Pyramids, and Papyrus. Fifty chapters contain something for everyone, questions you've always wondered about, and subjects to intrigue and challenge your friends. Pirates, Pyramids, and Papyrus by Brian Dunning, with a foreword by Richard Saunders of the Australian Skeptics. It's available now from major online booksellers as a paperback and as an e-book. Or get a personalized copy from Skeptoid.com. I'm Brian Dunning from Skeptoid.com. So we're here at the National Center for Science Education, and it's a, it's a nice little building here in Oakland, and it's, oh, you should see it, folks. There's a, a wonderful crop mobile circle. crop circle. Well, I'm looking at the mobile, the mobile of the solar system oh, yes. hanging from the ceiling, which is, that's really nice. It's all the planets there. Crop circle of your the older old logo. logo. <laughs> on the wall, a picture. There's a giant inflatable globe of the Earth just hanging off a pipe. Uh, Charles Darwin dolly hung on the wall. There are dinosaurs and birds hanging from the ceiling. There's a, a T-Rex skeleton over there. Jeannie, what, what, what must it be like to wa- come here to work every day? Oh, great fun. Great fun. It's, um, uh, yeah, my, my I, I actually am not the interior decorator of NCSE. These mostly have been strung up by uh, colleagues of mine who, uh, you know, gee, we just got a new, uh, a new pterodactyl uh, inflatable uh, uh, toy. Let's hang it up. So yeah, fine, yeah. That, that works, whatever. Well, I can see <clears throat> at least four. From one, two, three, four pterodactyls hanging from be- various bits of the ceiling I, I, at the moment. I suspect David Almond Smith is, is responsible for that. He's uh, he uh, he has a great sense of play, and, and we we benefit greatly from his. Uh... Now, a lot of these things have been sent to us by members. We have a um, a place a, a, a foot mat. Uh, you yeah. Know, a, 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 what's the... Why well, it's, it's a doormat. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You're yeah. not in Kansas anymore, it says. <laughs> that was sent to us by one of our members. But it's hanging uh, on the wall. It's, it's not hanging on the, on the wall. Yeah. And mostly yeah. we, we take photographs when, when we get visitors. Yeah. We usually pose them beneath the, you're not in Kansas anymore, <laughs> uh, mat. So, so it, oh, we'll it have is, to get one. I'll have to get we, one, you and, you and I, under the, the doormat. And uh, but that that of course is is an in joke in that the state of Kansas has uh, had a history over time of wrestling with the creationism and evolution issue, and their state board of education made a number of very poor decisions uh, back, especially from about 2000 to about 2005. And so Kansas kind of became something of a of a catchword for creationism in the country. You're not in Kansas anymore. That's a wonderful it's, it's really doormat. It's, it's yes. sort of, and that's a phrase, of course, from The Wizard of Oz. It is from the indeed. Movie. Yes. We're, well, we're not in Kansas, Kansas anymore, Toto, or something like that's that. Right. Dorothy's Toto, is. I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. You know it. Now, <laughs> this uh, doormat is strategically placed, I must say, near one of the most famous rooms in the, the whole place, which oh, is yes. the, the bathroom. It's true. Let's. Sh- shall we take a trip? Open the door. Come into the bathroom with me, Jeannie. And uh, it gets a little echoey in here. It does, and it's uh, it's a room about the size of um, three or four phone boxes, I guess. It's quite spacious for a bathroom. It's probably about um, five or six six by eight or, you know, something. It's pretty good size. um, And we've taken advantage of the size by uh, using the wall space to put some of our favorite correspondence. It's it's wall-to-wall correspondence in here up on big notice boards and... Good grief! There's the, oh, they're all emails and things, and and, and press and clippings letters, and, and yes. handwritten letters and things. And I happen to notice there's even a photograph of me up there. Your your very lovely postcard yeah, that you sent to NCSE and Dr. Scott. All the best. And looking Richard very Sanders. very grim with my bent spoon. There. Yes, indeed. Well, I can understand why you have tomato soup all over your shirt as a result <laughs> of that bent. But we we have we have our favorite stuff on here, and it's it's from a variety of sources. Um, Things from people who, um, you know, have said very, very nice things about us. Uh, someplace here, although right now, of course, I'm not finding it. We have a very nice note from uh, Nobel laureate um, uh, Stephen Weinberg talking about, you know, how important our work oh, was that's, in that's great. Texas. I mean, there are so many. This was so lovely. So many things stuck everywhere. It's, it's, I'm not surprised. Have, you know, we have. Um, 
other male, like, um, so you're the dirty bastards responsible for shoving that liberal bullshit down our kids' throats. You should be ashamed of yourselves. May Almighty God, the creator of all things, have mercy on your soul. So you know, not everybody's a fan. But, but, he, but he left it with a nice <laughs> sentence at the end. He was, hoping, <laughs> he was wishing you well in a strange story. And there's a, a parrot hanging down from the wall. It's, oh, a, yes. it's a big sort of soft, cuddly toy parrot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right now, I, I, I thank you for calling attention. We need to dust the parrot. Oh, yes, it is a dusty parrot. But yes, yeah, this is true. We, we do have... Um, uh, we have a, a, a letter from four young ladies, apparently. Uh, uh, I'm a Christian. My name is Brittany, and I hate evolution. I don't believe it. Your nonsense is just a bunch of fake. And she goes on similarly. But at the end, she says, have a, have a good day, atheist people. So, you know, <laughs> thanks, Brittany, and your friends. So we have a number of things, and, and one of my favorites um, one of my favorites is uh, uh, the the claim that I am the foremost terrestrial authority on Genesis, and Ooh. you know we, we we like that very much. We 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 think that that's that that leaves a great deal of of room for people to think about. You know, well, <laughs> is there a lunar terrestrial <laughs> authority on Genesis? Well, I'm, I'm not I, sure. I imagine that the, the foremost authority will take the time to write to you. Isn't and, well, that, isn't yeah, that he, wonderful? He actually corresponds with us regularly, and, and there, um, so we have good things and. The cartoons we, on the wall here and press clippings with with you. I see a couple. Of, well, I can see why why so, um, yeah, a, a visit have, to your bathroom is certainly an experience when when and, one visits the uh, and, NCS and newcomers actually. tend to uh, spend a lot of time here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, it takes people a long time to get out of the bathroom, but yes, it's. Um, uh, I'm, I must say, one one that was rather fun is uh, some a number of years ago. Somebody wrote, you know, "Hello, Mrs. Scott." I see, or Ms. Scott, I see your name everywhere, and I see you get around a lot, so I thought I'd email you and offer to buy you dinner if you ever get to Tulsa. Well. So I have a date in Tulsa if I'm so inclined. So it, it's fun. We, we get great mail, uh, both for and against, and um, the the choice pieces end up in our bathroom. So if anyone who uh, comes to visit should certainly a visit. Trip, a trip to the, the bathroom. Now we're just passing the giant inflatable globe, and I'm proud to say that Australia is is prominent, front and center. You bet. Although misshapen. There's a bay there, there's just an inlet of something there I've, I've never seen before. It's just where the, the two oh, worlds have come together. It has to do with the seam of the plastic. Yeah, I don't think yeah. you should take it personally. Uh, well, <laughs> it looks very strange. There we are. And when I look at this, I realize what an yeah. amazing thing it is to fly from Sydney and I can actually see right over. This up. is why it takes so long yeah. for you to get to visit us, it Richard. Does. It does. We love it every time, but yeah, boy, I tell you, it's a it's a contribution to. Uh, it's um, it's fun. Yeah, well, it's we fun. Love, Those we long, love your visits. long, long hours on the airplane, and there are, we're passing cubicles now with people very hard at work there, oh, making yes. sure this that is, the, uh, this is uh, Ray and David, our uh, support staff. Ray is our. Uh, business manager and uh, director of operations. Uh, now we're moving back into the uh, back portion of This used NCC. to be a storage room, this didn't it? Now it's, now it's office space. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a good sign. But, and, and like the rest of the, the, the rooms here, you have memorabilia everywhere. <laughs> another Darwin doll, another Darwin doll. There's a Darwin doll out there. There's a devil rubber ducky, <laughs> a skeleton on a motorbike. It's... <laughs> It's quite fun walking yeah, well, around here. Yeah, you know, various various staff have sort of left different decorations hither and yon, and so there you have it. We also have a, a lovely little cute children's art painting of Noah's Ark there. And oh, yeah, I see it, yes, uh, yes. Also very charming. We haven't found a place to put that up. Yeah, people send us Darwin dolls a lot, so we kind of tend to have a, <laughs> a whole you know, schoolroom of, of Darwin dolls. And But another place that I want to show you, Richard, yeah. is... Come around the corner one here. One of my favorite parts of this. Right to the very back far corner. Oh, through a myster- mysterious door. We'll shut that this door. mysterious room has our library and archives. Wow, look at this. Really, and of course some storage too as well. But we have you know, one, two, three, four uh, bookshelves, um, uh, two uh, rows of books on each side, one, two, yep, three, four, yep. five tiers. So I, yep. it's like Charles, a mini library. Charles could tell you exactly how many books, how many volumes we have in our library. But it's been building up over the years. And 
We have in our library, there's two kinds of books, basically. We have regular straight science books on evolution, a um, number of books on Darwin and, yeah. and so forth and so on. But then we also have the creationist library. Well, you have to, don't and, you? Yes, exactly, because yes. they, they are not as likely to be found in your library, in your public library. Is this the creationist university. side of here? It's all, it's mixed up. It's, oh, it's mixed up. Yeah. I'm just noticing the first thing I see here, the flood. There we go. Life itself. Oh, so Galileo. So many books here, folks. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds on yes, the topic. Mm-hmm. Several hundreds. Yeah. And but maybe what's even more interesting to um, to scholars, um, uh, we do get scholars literally from around the world who are interested in the American creationism and evolution controversy, they will come here to use our archives, not so much the books that we've just been looking at, yeah. but the files. Ah, the, um, the final shelf here we come the, to. We have files on, um, on the uh, creationist uh, controversies in various states. Uh, just looking here, here's one, uh, the Alabama textbook disclaimer case, Darby, Montana. Yeah. Um, we have uh, Selman versus Cobb County. That was a big legal case. We've got a lot of stuff there. We have uh, the archives, of course, from Kitzmiller versus Dover. I bet um, you did, yeah. Lots and lots of good yeah. stuff. And um, also uh, some some journals, um, Students for Origins Research. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, going way, way back to the, oh, they look quite the very old, being, yes. 1978. Oh, wow. And actually, this might be of interest to some of your listeners. Yeah. It was, um, it was uh, when our uh, archivist of the time um, was uh, helping staff find materials that would be relevant to the Kitzmiller versus Dover case back in 2004, 2005. Um, one of the things that um, we did was go back and look through some of this old archival material from the 70s and 80s. And she was able to find... Um, an article from the Students for Origins Research from fall of 1981. Yeah. You might even take a photograph of this. Yeah. Unbiased Biology Textbook Planned. Good heavens. And this was a reference to a book that was planned by the Foundation for Thought and Ethics, Charles B. Thaxton, talking about how they wanted to produce a book that would be a high school biology supplement which would have both creation and evolution in it. And this would be, you know, supposedly uh, suitable to be sold in public schools. Wow. They were going to try to go into the textbook market. Now, remember, this was, um, the, the, the date on this, of course, was 1981. This is before the uh, court decisions um, that declared that the teaching of creationism was unconstitutional. You could not yes. bring it. So this was still when they thought that they would be able to do this. Well, this was this planned book was the ancestor of the book that eventually was produced by Thaxton and the Foundation for Thought and Ethics of Pandas and People, which was very significant in the whole Dover, uh, Pennsylvania controversy, because that was the book that the school board members sought to have taught uh, in the yeah, Dover yeah. school system. So finding this kind of th- this reference was key because when we told our when we told the lawyer the, the legal team, we found this reference from thought, uh, the Foundation for Thought and Ethics (FTE) that they were making. You know, they they had in mind a creation and evolution book. Gee, I wonder if any early manuscripts are still around. Well, the lawyers very quickly decided that was something they wanted to look into. They subpoenaed any early manuscripts of pandas and people from Foundation for Thought and Ethics. I would have loved to have been a fly on that wall (laughs) when that subpoena came in, because FTE must have just died. But, you know, to their credit, uh, they did not just find a shredder someplace, which would have been illegal, but... You know, in one sense, who would have known, right? Uh, they coughed up the manuscripts, oh, well. and um, using those manuscripts, we were able to show a direct progression from creationist textbooks called, you know, creation biology and other titles like that, all the way up through the several manu- manuscripts to the book that they eventually published right. called, of Pandas and People. But uh, and during the course of this evolution, so to speak, they adroitly substituted the word. 
intelligent, the phrase intelligent design, wherever they had said previously creationism. That's quite so, famous, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You, and and I, I, you probably gave a talk on this where I saw that. You can do a search through the manuscript and see where they've simply replaced one word for the other. That's right. Yeah. And we were able to present that information to the judge, or the lawyers obviously presented. We provided that information yeah, yeah. to the lawyers. And that was very influential in helping to convince the judge that intelligent design really was just creation science with a new label. That's right. And, of course, since the courts in the U.S. had already determined that you that teaching creation science was unconstitutional, if intelligent design is creation science, duh, <laughs> it's unconstitutional. <laughs> so, um, oh, what a valuable that, little... That, that little article yeah. that I showed you turned out to be the, um, the source of what turned out to be a pretty important wow. uh, uh, argument wow. in a pretty important legal case. So it's all here. Well, a lot is, a uh, lot is here. A yeah, lot there's is here. lots and lots and lots here. So, yeah. And, uh, of course, we also have um, the... Uh, ah, the, the merchandise. <laughs> <laughs> Project, I must Steve tell you, I must tell you, you gave me very kindly in 2004 yeah. when I spoke for the the skeptics in Berkeley. Yeah. That's probably when I met you for the first time, I think. Or pretty close to it. Around then. As a thank you, you gave me a Project Steve t-shirt. Oh, delighted right? I did so. A blue one. Yeah. It's... It doesn't seem to age. In fact, it's been washed more times than I care to, to think. And the letters are still good and the shirt is good quality. So whatever the manufacturer is, it, and I tell you what, of all the shirts, the T-shirts I wear with skeptical bits and slogans, yeah. that one gets people tapping me on the shoulder or asking me about it. Wonderful. It really does. So Isn't pleased. that something? But our normal, uh, if, if you come to our Grand Ooh, Canyon trip, another box of shirts. We, have, we have this great ah, shirt. Wow. Huh. And there's a cutaway of the geology of Grand Canyon showing yeah, the yeah. various layers. So the, and on one side is the creation model, oh, starting wow. at 4000 BC. Yeah. <laughs> and the other side is the evolution yeah, model, yeah, yeah. starting at uh, 2 billion years. So this is, this is a shirt you get if you do the Grand Canyon That's trip. That's correct. <gasps> See how tempting. Oh, See how it's tempting. worth it just for the shirt. Heck yes. What, what, a, what a great looking shirt That's that is. It is. It's really a great shirt. And uh, if you think people tap you on the shoulder wearing the steam <laughs> shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, that's so, a big yeah. shirt. That's a big well, this is a XL. extra large. Oh. So, yeah, it comes in various sizes. But yeah, we order shirts for the people who go on our Grand Canyon trip, and we do have a great time. We do have a great time. Yeah, our, our Grand Canyon shirt is a creation and evolution trip. It is? Yes. You see, if you go with the Institute for Creation Research, yeah. you only get the creationist view. Ah. But if you come with NCSC, you yeah. get the creation and the evolution view. I will give you the creationist view, and we bring a, a geologist along who teaches the hell out of you in terms of the geology of Grand Canyon. <laughs> you really get a lot of Grand Canyon information. Would you care to meet some of my other... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, some of my other... Um, just wander up the stairs here. Yes, there is another level. Now, this is up on the... We call this the loft. The loft. And we lock up the, uh, the project people up here. <laughs> Passing more dinosaurs as we go. Oh, yes. Lots of, and lots I don't of mean the here. staff. Lots of, <laughs> lots of good records. This is my new, newest colleague, Mark McCaffrey. He's our climate science guy. This is my friend Richard Saunders. Great to meet you, Richard. Okay, and? Josh Rosenow. He's one of our project people as well. He's one of the flare-ups wranglers. And uh, he's also been helping a lot with the uh, climate change initiative. And so, you, you guys have ended up in the top. That's right, in the penthouse, we like to the call it. The penthouse. You're calling it the loft. It's the yeah. penthouse. The penthouse, yes. And how long have you been here? For Four years, four and a half years. Um, so what has changed in your four years here most noticeably? Well, we're dealing with climate change now, which is That's the biggest a change. Big change. But yeah. yeah. And, I mean, it's, you, you've, there's be, definitely been a shift since 2007, less talk about intelligent design, I think more of a move back to sort of traditional creationism, Do you think creation intelligent, science. Intelligent design has, has had its day? It's, it's failed and they've moved on? It never really had a lot of energy as a, as a political strategy and as a legal strategy. It had legs for a while, but then it lost in court, and it didn't. It never had enthusiasm in its own right. You don't hear much about it anymore. So yeah, I, I must think, admit. Yeah, you know, the Discovery Institute still promoting it, but it's not exciting for anybody else anymore. You know, I, I think it's, it's entirely good. possible that 
the Discovery Institute or other people associated with the uh, intelligent design movement are behind some of the Academic Freedom Act um, uh, issues because they have been pushing the uh, Academic Freedom Act types of, of proposals and legislation. Um, and certainly their model bill that they wrote a few years ago, uh, bits and pieces of that have been it, – it, it showed up in the – law that the state of Florida uh, almost got passed, fortunately didn't pass. And there's sort of remnants of that that sort of trickle around and mm-hmm. pop up periodically in other states. So mm. that's part of the monitoring that we do, uh, yeah, trying yeah, to trace things back yeah. and where does this come from and, oh, yes. Right. Okay. And um, it's a shift away from let's talk about intelligent design to let's talk about whatever the teacher wants to talk about in addition to evolution. Yes. So not even saying it has to be intelligent design. It could be, I mean, they could bring in stuff from Answers in Genesis, and say, oh, yeah, the Earth was created 6,000 years ago in six 24-hour days. I mean, it's still illegal. It's still unconstitutional, as it, as it ever was. Yeah. Same thing with intelligent design, but it's making it a little bit harder to, to shut down a teacher and stop a teacher from doing that, from, from going outside the science like that. Okay. Yeah, a lot of these Academic Freedom Act uh, proposals uh, that we see are, are permissive, you know, they allow a teacher to bring information in that that supplements the uh, the uh, curriculum. Uh, they don't require the teacher to do it, and so that makes it harder to challenge on the face of the of the proposal itself. It's harder to challenge the law itself it, if it says, "Well, you can do this. You don't have to do this, but you can do it." Hmm. So that means you've got to find the teacher that's actually doing it. If you're going to challenge the law, so there's a delib- there's a reason why those laws are, are structured that way. The other thing that we're finding these laws do is they are protective. They they protect a teacher who wants to bring in additional material, and bringing in additional material is code for bringing in some form of. <laughs> We're talking bringing in wow. creationism, okay? Wow. Come on. Th- this is backdoor creationism. Yeah, yeah. But it's all done under the guise of you know, promoting critical thinking and, and reasoning and no, dare objective we say, analysis. Teach both sides. That comes well, I, I, that's not even the phrase that it's used. It's just no? in the bill, it'll just say, in the interest, you know, there, there is a secular interest in promoting critical thinking and objective analysis. And of, academic freedom of uh, the And teacher. academic freedom of the teacher. Like, uh, all these things that how can you be against this, right? It sounds so reasonable. But in practice, as soon as anyone is asked, well, what other views are not being represented? Well, you know, God created the earth and evolution is wrong, <laughs> right? It's, that's still what's behind it. It's still trying to find a way to get that in. It's just the, the language of the bill is less overt about it. But they often will bundle up uh, global warming, evolution, stem cells, and things like that. So the, 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 they, they kind of draw a red flag to themselves when they you know, call out specific areas of science that are so-called controversial. Yeah. Now, I was just as we were chatting earlier, Jeannie, about uh, the um, movement uh, to look at uh, global warming and climate change. Climate change. When, uh, whenever I mention this on my podcast, I get letters from everybody twice and their dogs. You know, calling me an idiot from from both directions and everything. You've really, you're really in an area which is uh, like a hornet's nest. No question. Yeah. But uh, everybody and their brother and their dog are actually, from what we're seeing, a very small, very vocal, very uh, effective group of uh, naysayers who uh, some t- somehow have the time to be able to look like their numbers are much greater than they actually are. And they're all experts. Absolutely. <laughs> no question. It hits a nerve. Yeah, yeah, but look at all the practice we got dealing with evolution for 25 years. <laughs> Actually, it was very funny. A journalist who was interviewing me last week when we announced um, in this you know, second week of, of January 2012, when we announced the, the initiative, uh, a journalist that I knew called me up. She said, you know, so like the frying pan wasn't hot enough, you had to jump into the fire. <laughs> That's good. That's a good analogy. Yeah, it is. All right, gentlemen, I wish you lots of luck. Thank you. I really do. I mean, you're right, as if you didn't have a, a hard enough task before. Oh, and, and please do not think that we were bored, I mean, that we didn't have enough to do with evolution. I mean, the, evolution, the anti-evolution movement marches on a pace. These people have not um, gone into holes and decided they've been whooped. 
there, there's this constant background radiation that we have of bills that are proposed, but especially, you know, at that local level where teachers get leaned on, where school districts are flirting with changing the curriculum. I mean, that is our bread and butter. That is what we do all the time at NCSE, and we're going to continue doing that. But now, now that we have Mark on staff, uh, we're going to take on this new issue as well, and hopefully we'll be able to help teachers with it. Well, Jeannie, as if your job wasn't hard enough. It's, it's, it's a collective. It's, it, uh, of course it is. Of course it is. Endeavor here. It, it really is. But, uh, what a pleasure it's been to visit you once again in this uh, wonderful place. And I, I'll be back next year for our annual update. You, I can promise you that. You do that. Hallo aan alle Nederlandse luisteraars. Op dit moment bent u aan het luisteren naar de Skeptic Zone. Voor wetenschap en kritisch nadenken. Voor meer informatie ga naar www.skepticzone.tv Now it's time for Dr. Rachie Reports with Dr. Rachel Dunlop. Something a little bit different now, and thanks to the internet, we have videos of cats, online banking, and the spread of millions of conspiracy theories on just about anything. The moon landing was faked. JFK was shot by a man on the grassy knoll. Princess Di was murdered by the monarchy. September 11 was an inside job. Just about every major event in history has conspiracy theories attached to them. With the introduction of email and sites like Facebook, mere rumour now spreads like wildfire around the world. And experts say conspiracy theories are increasing, becoming a cultural virus. Well, as far as conspiracy theories go, I have one that the Nazis built a spaceship and it's still hidden up behind the moon. There was a second gunman who shot JFK. 9-11 being an inside job and not actually being a terrorist attack. America loves their conspiracy theories. It's claimed KFC is run by the KKK and makes black men Impotent. It's reported nearly half of Americans believe global warming is a conspiracy. And here's Michael Jackson apparently getting out of his own coroner's van. But Australia is no different. Recently, an email circulated claiming to show proof that our Prime Minister had once claimed in a newsletter to be in a lesbian relationship. In fact, it had been faked. But many people forwarded the email on without checking its authenticity. It's also been claimed Harold Holt was abducted by a Chinese submarine and Dave Hughes and Dave Thornton are both the same person because they're never on the project at the same time. Oh yeah, true, sometimes I do a little bit of Hughie. So what draws us to a good conspiracy theory and why in the information age does fiction often win out over fact? <laughs> Dr. Rachel Dunlop is the Vice President of the Australian Skeptics New South Wales and, if conspiracy is to be believed, possibly a robot. Rachel, <laughs> why are so many people drawn to these conspiracy theories? Hi, Charlie. I'm not a robot, but um, <laughs> a lot of people are drawn to conspiracy theories because they're so much fun and they're fascinating, aren't they? And, I mean, when you look at probably the real explanation for the reason something happens, it's usually much more simple, much more boring, and I guess it's a bit like the truth is out there, you know, an X-Files kind of thing. There's something, if there's something more interesting and weird and, and creepy going on, it's much more interesting and fun. <laughs> What's the silliest uh, conspiracy theory you've ever heard? Carrie, there are so many, but I think my favourite would have to be the Illuminati and the New World Order. And this is a, a conspiracy theory that um, it, it revolves around the idea that there's a bunch of people called the New World Order who want to take over the world um, and form one government. And it also involves the Illuminati, which involves the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers from the United States, and the lizard people. Now, the lizard people are <laughs> apparently a group of... Um, Lizard overlords who are amongst one of them is George W. Bush. The royal family are apparently reptiles living inside human skin until one day they can come out and take over the world. I find it hard to believe you, you it's, wouldn't it's believe that, Rachel. <laughs> now, Rachel, I've got a friend who's probably watching because he's got far too much time on his hands. He believes every single conspiracy theory going around, and I, I never correct him. Is, is it healthy for him just to believe? Well, no, I mean, it can get to a 
a point where people become very paranoid and sit in their houses with tinfoil hats. But there's a serious side to it as well. I mean, you know, there's something like 50% of Americans believe that 9-11 was an inside job. So... It turns out now that some people are following these conspiracy theories when they're voting or when they're choosing health advice on the internet, like to vaccinate their children. Now, but something a bit more serious now, if I could get your answer quickly and, and honestly, are you in fact a robot? <laughs> Um, there's no evidence to suggest I am, but you could easily invent a conspiracy on the internet, Charlie, and see how it goes. Yeah, this is exactly the kind of excuses I would expect from a robot. Dr. Rachel Dunlop, thank you very much for setting us straight tonight. Thank you. Eugenie Scott, Executive Director of the National Center for Science Education in Oakland, California. We defend and support the teaching of evolution and climate change when it comes under attack for religious and political reasons. We help teachers, parents, school boards, and other citizens defend good science in the schools. Come visit us at ncse.com and on YouTube and Facebook. And let us know if science comes under attack in your community. We're here to help. Listening to episode 171 of the Skeptic Zone. Well, I've made my way here to Market Street. Yes, the, the main street, I guess you could say, of San Francisco. And it is really alive with action. It's getting towards uh, knockoff time, of course. People are starting to head home, but the streets are alive. There are trams and buses, taxis and cars, and people everywhere. Well, on next week's show, I'm really not sure what we have for you on next week's show. Maybe some report from some reports from some of our reporters, I hope. I'm going down to visit Brian Dunning, maybe a word or two from him. But for now, anyway, from downtown San Francisco, this is Richard Saunders signing off. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports.